Tuju Papa Mio. And you scroll down. Okay, like I'm just scrolling down right now. Hello, everybody. God bless you. Okay. And so, and we go to this place called Papa Prayer. Prayer for priests. And we begin okay, with a prayer. Let us first place ourselves in the presence of God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let us pray. Almighty eternal God, look upon the face of Christ and for the love of him who is the eternal high priest. Have mercy on your priests. Remember, O most compassionate God, that they are but weak and frail human beings. Stir up in them the grace of their vocation, which is bestowed on them by the imposition of the bishop's hands. Keep them close to you, lest the enemy prevail against them, so that they may never do anything in the slightest degree unworthy of their sublime vocation. Oh Jesus, I pray for your faithful and fervent priests, for your unfaithful and tempered priest, for your priest laboring at home or abroad in distant mission fields, for your attempted priest, for your lonely priest, for your young priest, for your aged priest, for your sick priest, for your dying priests, for the souls of your priest in purgatory. But above all, I recommend to you the priest dearest to me, the priest who baptized me, the priest who absolved me from my sins, the priest at whose masses I assisted and who gave me your body and blood in holy communion, the priest who taught and instructed me or helped me and encouraged me or the priest to whom I am indebted in, a, in, a, in any other way, particularly I pray, let us pray for Pope Francis and Pope Benedict and all the Papa priests and the priests that you know, though the ones who help you. Oh Jesus, keep them close to your sacred heart and bless them abundantly in time and eternity. Oh Mary, amen. Amen, everybody. Amen. amen. Oh Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make, Make your, your priest holy. holy. Oh, Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make, Make your, your priest, priest holy. 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 Oh, Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make, Make your, your priest, priest, your priest holy. holy. Saint John Vianney. Pray for us. Pray for us. And Alphonsus. Pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you, Amen. everybody. God bless you all. And uh, once again, greeting from Papa. <laughs> this is Papa, Papa Mio Papa, which is priest always, prayer apostolate. We pray for priests. Okay? And we promote you to pray for priests because one priest goes to heaven. How many follows? A thousand. Thousand? Yeah. A thousand souls. Maybe of a thousand souls. One priest going down drags a thousand with him so yeah so now i'm going to do this i'll show you something since many um or maybe you um you joined this study the first time and you're wondering what is this all about so first of all we want to send you blessings okay Secondly, we want to introduce to you what we are about. We're about prayer and uh, promoting people to pray. So you have right there three Ps, prayers, promotion, and people. Promo promoting people to pray. Four priests, that's the fourth one. Okay. So why? Because one priest goes to hell, thousands follows. One goes to heaven, thousand, you know, get into heaven with him. As now, as of now, we have in the Papa, 
um, organization, 224. Right there, you go to Papa website. Okay, we have three bishops, right? So that means just suppose one priest carries a thousand. So you have right there 224,000 people going to heaven already. If these priests go to heaven, including me, or when they want to go to heaven. Okay? So that's how important. But then you have to multiply um, the role of the bishop because each bishop could ten, bring 10,000 people into heaven. Or if he goes, he falls, 10,000 or even more. Okay, so just let's say a bishop would influence uh, not 1,000, but 100,000. Is that not true? Yes. Yeah, the, Arch the Archdiocese of Gaveston, Houston, or Los Angeles alone have a million people. Yeah, million people. So one bishop goes down, millions follow. Mm. Mm. Not just for one generation, but many generations. A bishop turns a heretic. Okay, <clears throat> generation after generation, like Arius or you know um, Nestorius, those priests and bishops, they still follow. Mm. Until now, a lot of people follow the uh, erratic or the or erroneous way. So. We need to pray for priests. That is the point. And so that's what we do. And uh, we're not just praying alone. We, um, we're practical. That's why we study Jesus. And we study it through Faith ZBS. We recently had a retreat and election conference. And we discussed this uh, reading, the gospel readings already in my homilies. And I, I think I had two homilies, different homilies for the same reading, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go straight mm -hmm. to um, study of the Bible. So we have decided we cannot study everything. So we have decided to restrict ourselves and we restrict uh, the study of the Bible on, um, on the readings of the scriptures of um, the Sunday's uh, celebration. Okay. That means... We're gonna re we restricted the sec the first thing is just Sunday um, readings for for the masses. Okay. Secondly, we restrict ourselves to the study of the readings on the previous Sunday. It's easier because everybody should know it. Okay, the whole world should know it. And the um, the recent Sunday is the second Sunday of Lent. Okay, so we study all those uh, readings, scriptural readings in that Sunday. But we will restrict ourselves, restrict ourselves once again. We will be focusing on the gospel. We study the gospel. And then we restrict ourselves once again. We're going to study the gospel, not from the pastoral or sociological or political or whatever point of view, except the biblical point of view. Okay? And that is already a lot. Hmm? So that's how we approach it. And uh, the way to approach the scripture is that we... Uh, we would go to churches and attend masses, or uh, we could attend the YouTube homilies from everybody, not just Catholic priests. Okay, you attend them, and uh, what you do is that uh, what you do is that you um, you report, you record, and you report. What is the point? Okay, one question. What? Okay, threefold. Uh, what question? What is it? What is the point? Secondly, so what? Thirdly, now what? Okay. What is it? What is the point? Second, how is it related to us? And thirdly, what I'm going to do about it? So everybody could have one question every time you hear anybody speak. And so that's what we do. That's the method. Okay. And then the second part is that we study the scripture. We divide it into three parts. The first phase, the first part, I will do a synopsis of the readings. Okay. Second, you will share the experience. And third, we will study the, the gospel. I hope that is clear. Okay. Yes. So let us get straight to the first phase, which is summarizing the readings of the 
of Sunday, it's the second Sunday of Advent. So the first Sunday we had um, the coming, the sudden coming of um, you know, judgment, okay? Like the Noah, the flood, and Sodom. Second Sunday of Advent, we have we have um, the um, the preparation. We could call it the Sunday of preparation. The first Sunday is the call to observation, really observing in two senses. Uh, first, you have to observe the sign of time and uh, be, be prepared for the end. It comes suddenly, and also. Um, the second sense of observation means that you have to observe the law of the Lord. You observe him and you follow him. Second Sunday, do you see the first reading, Isaiah? The Lord is sending us these wonderful shoots. Okay, a shoot from the stomach of Jesse, the, the spirit, the sevenfold spirit of God to prepare. So you see Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 to 10, the spirit of the Lord rests upon him. Okay. So you have wisdom and understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Okay. Now, I want to zoom in the word knowledge. Do you understand that um, knowledge in Latin is scientia, <clears throat> which is science? Okay. So you understand that science or knowledge is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, one, one branch of the sevenfold uh, gift of the Holy Spirit or sevenfold spirit. Okay, and uh, it's only one. That means our faith is not canceling knowledge or science. It's part of our faith, our religion. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit or it uh, branches out from the Holy Spirit. But we may have lots of knowledge, even false knowledge, and the majority of the information we have gathered now, you know, we have every day, most of them are not real true knowledge. Yeah. And we uh, place, if we stick our life on them, so that's why we have to make a distinction to know the difference, which one is which, okay? And in order to, to filter out which knowledge is the, the fake one, which one is true one, we need to have wisdom. And it seems that uh, our culture has got rid of wisdom. We, we base everything on knowing and information, okay? I know better than you, so therefore I'm more powerful or whatever, I'm better than you, no. So the very first spirit of the Lord is the spirit of wisdom. And what is wisdom? What does it do? It filters out fake from true. Yes, but it's more than that. Center, uh, sets up what's right and what's wrong. Yeah, that's, wisdom is, that's counsel. It's, it's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord no. is a gift. They are they're re all related, okay? So the nature of wisdom, you have to smell the word wisdom and see what that is. Knowledge is all about accumulating. You accumulate knowledge and you keep it, you use it, you systematize them, okay? That's called history or any kind of science, just experience systematized. You get some experience and uh, you don't want to confuse yourself, so you or, or, uh, organize them into systems. And so we could remember easily, just like the um, multiplication table. You memorize it, right? You, you organize it. Numbers are two plus two, or two times two is four. You know, That's like that. knowledge. Yeah, information and knowledge. You know, it mm -hmm. cannot be a false because it is what it is. You can deny it. Mm -hmm. okay? But wisdom is not about accumulation, but detachment. Detachment? Yeah. Wow. So you're getting rid of decluttering all those things you hoard. Yeah. Many, so, many things. 
So uh, what remains is not the, the possessions or the property or the things you have, you acquired. What remains is the freedom of movement. You know how to use those things or thoughts, okay? The skills you, you have uh, learned. So wisdom would do this. So I'll give you the example, uh, since we're both talking about Isaiah, okay? Um, I learned to play piano, but I don't bring the piano everywhere I go. Yeah. I would bring four or five keyboards with me anytime I travel. I just bring my version, the skill I have taught it. And it gets detached from the, the very first piano I learned to play. Wisdom is the freedom. So these fingers could play any piano around the world. The freedom. Yes. Yeah, and sometimes you, have, you could close your eyes, you play it for mm -hmm. hours. Yeah? So it's detachment. Now, the Lord is sending uh, in Isaiah the, um, the spirit okay, upon this Messiah. And it's all about the Messiah. He comes with the seven, the, the central sevenfold spirit to judge uh, the poor people, the church for the poor people. Justice that brings about justice, okay. And uh, he's gonna speak for the poor people. That brings peace for the poor people. Okay. The coming of the Messiah. That's the first reading. Second, the same theme. Okay, the Messiah comes with justice, and so justice will flourish. The response oral Psalm Psalm seventy two. Okay. In order to have justice, you have to have judgment. And you cannot judge without justice. The criteria is to have justice, to be just. So judgment is coming. We need to prepare for judgment. Justice shall cooperate. And because of justice, there's peace. The whole point is, is there will be no peace without justice. The, the, uh, the root of peace, world peace, is justice. Okay? Justice. And then, so we say we want to um, create peace for the world. But as long as there's injustice, there will be no peace. Okay? That means we have to handle, have to learn how to be just. And let it flourish in us. Am I losing everybody now? No, that's great. No. no justice, no peace. And what is just use? Just righteousness. You're on the right track. Justice is the right relationship between you and God. Oh. If you have no God, there's no justice. Okay, you're straight with God. And you could be straight with God. You have to be straight with yourself. You cannot distort everything and, you know, um, ban everything according to your own device or desire or delight. To be right, righteous, justice. And the Lord is just. Second reading, which is Romans chapter 15, five verses. Christ saves everyone. That's the theme. Okay. So the presence of Jesus Christ is so for the salvation of all humankind. Okay. That means if you want to be saved, you have to have Jesus Christ. And what does it mean to have Jesus Christ? Well, we have to take time and learn. Think about Christ. You may not know him, but get to know the Lord, Jesus Christ. Slowly, he will bring you into, uh, into salvation. Okay. The gospel reading. We're almost done with the first phase. I will proclaim the gospel for you. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1 to 12. Matthew chapter 12, uh, no, chapter 3, 
sorry, chapter 3, verse 1 to 12. Are you ready? Let's uh, read and listen to the gospel. Okay. The Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you. Glory Holy. to you, Lord. John the Baptist appeared preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was for him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said a voice of one crying out in the desert. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem or Judea and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce good fruits as evidence of your repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the ax lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance. But the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His word winnowing, uh, winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his thresh, threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Here ends the first phase. We move to the second phase, which is reporting. Okay, so I turn the table, the microphone, whatever, the camera on you, but I'm not turning against you, okay? <laughs> so take over, um, Linda, let's go Linda first, okay? Okay, good morning, Father Michael. Good morning, Linda, good to see you. Always good to see you. And everybody. I saw you and now I get to see you more. Yeah. <laughs> so what I did was I listened to the homily of Bishop Robert Barron, and okay. he's the bishop of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And the main theme of the homily was to go meet John the Baptist in the desert. So in your quiet place where, where, where you have no diversions and distractions and wake up, open your eyes, repent, reform, change, that we may see the new kingdom, this person of Jesus. And there was some um, commentary about, you know, where, who is this person of Jesus? And in Jesus, divinity and humanity have met, Heaven and earth have come together. God's will is done on earth as in heaven. In Jesus, this new way of being has appeared. So let John, ba John the Baptist work within us. And the actions that uh, were recommended, you know, strongly recommended to take or to come to grip with our sins and confess, get the spiritual healing for our soul and see Jesus in us. 
And so what has uh, actually through your homilies and retreat also what has come to mind for me or at the front of my mind is to work on the inclinations of deadly sin. Well, it was mentioned in his homily too. And so I have several that I work on that I need to work on more and especially using Advent as the time to do more focus. Um, but it's a journey for me. It's always a journey. <laughs> and, and to keep, um, to also take advantage of confession and spiritual healing. Okay. So let me sum it up. So number one, go meet John the Baptist. Okay. So you could meet the Christ. Who is he? Okay. And then... To get to him or meet him, you have to uh, repent by going to confession. Is that clear enough? Mm -hmm. I get the points. Okay. So thank you, Bishop Baron, and thank you, Linda, for uh, attending that uh, homily and recording it and sharing with us. Okay? So what do you take home with? What is something that you never knew before in this um, homily from the bishop? something new at all or anything new well i i didn't really cover this but i mean he went over the images that's in the gospel okay. um and that was it new went. to it, 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 it was new to me so one example was the winnowing fan okay. to clear the threshing floor and that that's the wind of the holy spirit that shakes things up in our life separating the good from the bad Okay. and spiritually cleansing us. Okay, that's the Holy Spirit. Interesting. Okay, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Bishop, again. Let's move. Can we move on to another person? Mary jo? Okay. Hello, Mary Jo. Thank you, Linda, again. Thank you, Bishop, again. We said three times. Thanksgiving. For Christmas. Mary Jo, you have something for us? Feed yes. us. Yes, Father. I was there at um, the uh, retreat and and did listen to your homily. And but I yeah, thought yeah. since most of us are here <laughs> who okay. went to it, I am gonna report on uh, the homily given by Father Frank Lanick in uh, the um, Diocese of Tyler, Texas, at the uh, Cathedral of the Immaculate, um, the Immaculate Conception, uh -huh. and uh, it uh, the at first the celebrant was Father Nicholas, but uh, Father Hank Lanick came up and gave the homily, and he is uh -huh. the pastor of the uh, of that parish. And uh, Father Lang Hank uh, began with uh, that. This is uh, Stewardship Sunday, so he's going to talk about being a good steward. And uh, for the church, it means something different than just thinking about money. He said, uh, when you hear Stewardship Sunday, Sunday, you you equate it with Monday money, but he said uh, that's not the true meaning of uh, being a good steward. He said God get, has given us all uh, opportunities to grow in wealth. He has given us gifts, special gifts, that uh, with our work and our coll collaboration uh, creates true wealth. And he repeated that twice. He said, God, the gifts the, that God gives us with our work and collaboration will create true wealth. And so he said, uh, according as the gospel talks about getting ready, he says, it uh, tells us to get ready for the Lord. And St. John's whole life was about preparing others for Christ. 
And he said that um, as a parish and a, a community in Tyler, Texas, they have a mission and it's to build uh, a kingdom of God for their parish. And he said there are many ministries in their uh, parish in Tyler. And he included not just the, the uh, Immaculate uh, Conception, but he also included uh, the other, uh, like the chapel of St. Peter and Paul and uh, another chapel that uh, is in the, uh, I guess it's the college. And uh, he said that all of them work together and want to build this kingdom of God in Tyler, Texas. And he said there are many ministries and he says he, he very much uh, is grateful to all the ministries that, that perform the corporal works of mercy, that work with the poor in their area and those who are needing counsel and uh, bring them into the Catholic Church. And so he uh, goes on about all the different ministries and it's amazing. He said their, their parish is growing. They have now, or their area is growing in number of Catholics. They have 3,121 uh, parishioners, but he said that every day they get more new people every day and they're growing. And uh, he's grateful to all the ones who have, uh, I guess, um, given their gifts to make all these wonderful things happen, like a soup kitchen, like um, people who travel to, uh, I think it's um, Haiti or some of the countries over there that are needing it you know help and uh many and many ministries so that's what his his homily was about and he encouraged everybody he thanked everyone for all that they're doing to make to build god's kingdom in tyler texas okay and um so what does that have to do with me um Yes, we do need to build a kingdom of God. And I'm grateful that I'm able to do some things that, I guess, ta share talents that God has given me. Uh, I teach second grade and I like uh, CCE classes. And I, I am uh, happy to share my faith with them and to... Uh, guide them into uh, becoming good, faithful Catholics. And um, I learned a lot from them. <laughs> and I've learned a lot from Faith CBS that I can share with them. So that that's it, Father. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mary Jo. Let me sum it up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Number one, you're welcome. I did not know, know what I did, so you could say thank you to me. But <laughs> I want to sum it up. <laughs> You're welcome anyway. I'm going to sum it up. Number one, build the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, in your parish, in your diocese, in your family, mm -hmm. by the work of ministry, the work of mercy, huh? mm -hmm. the work of corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. One of it. One of the spiritual work of mercy is to teach catechism. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other one, of course, the, uh, the corporal work of mercy is to feed the hungry. Mm -hmm. So those are the ways you build up the kingdom of heaven. So thank you, uh, Father Lanik, for sharing the, um, what is going on in the diocese of Tyler. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful news to hear. And, uh, May the Lord multiply and increase the people in that diocese as they fight for life and for the family. Okay? So for God, that's what they do. 
Okay, thank God and thank you, Mary Jo, for reporting, recording, reporting. Okay, all right, Mary Jo, what do you take home with? One point you take home with within that that family. That um, that we can God works through us. He our talents are are gifts that we do need to share, and he. It, he he gives us more through uh, our cooperation with him. It's an important point. The more you serve, the more he gives. The more you share, the more he gives you. So cooperation to the grace of God is important. Okay. Thank you, Mary Jo. Let's move up okay, to Denise. Okay. Hey. Yes. Thank you, Father. Yep. Thank you, Denise. Hello, Denise. Hello. So I did report on the homily from Saturday night at the retreat. Oh, my that's homily. Yes, your okay. homily. Very that's profound good. homily. Okay. Okay. So uh, many good points that I have, you know, written down and will keep in my heart it was uh, like a long homily it wasn't actually oh. that long saturday I night's couldn't... homily was not that long yeah, maybe know. maybe at the most 20 minutes and father mike schmitz was um always 20 minutes or more so it's it's really not that long and it was I really important to complain from one of the little you know children yes. why is your homily so long <laughs> that was the comic relief for the the weekend yes so okay. that was good no, go ahead Denise go ahead so the main point of the homily was to make a choice for God or the world the flesh and the devil either one of those and uh, that is the main message of the gospel and from St. John the Baptist. And your last line pretty much summed it up. Repent, think beyond yourself, smell beyond yourself, smell the kingdom of heaven for the kingdom of heaven is at close at hand. Um, some points that I uh, want to sh share and uh, have taken home and will keep in my heart. Um, so what does it mean to be thankful, uh, to smell thankfulness and to uh, ponder thankfulness and to think about how when we have passions, the wrathfulness, the uh, slothfulness, spinelessness, um, these all come and they really, uh, come into our, our, our feelings and burn. And, uh, basically we're not thankful. And then, uh, I like when you said that hell is the fire of hatred. Purgatory is the fire of expected love, like Advent. And heaven is the fire of consumed love. Because you asked us, is there fire in heaven? And many of us were saying different things. So that was very interesting. Um, you uh, spoke about how priests, uh, the sodomites, um, break the people's heart. And uh, repentance is needed, just as John the Baptist uh, spoke about and uh, an examination of conscience with repentance and then you brought in the Latin repentance metanoia right meta means go beyond and noia to think uh, to think beyond yourself to think beyond the ego um The chaff, uh, the fear of God, let's see, prophet, 
I'm running out of time. I want to make it shorter than three minutes, but I've already passed. Um, I love how you put smell the word, you know, smell these words and um, go beyond beginning repentance, go beyond not the good, make a commitment. Don't stop short. Continue on, make that commitment. How do you know you have true repentance? You look at what St. John the Baptist said, and you need to produce good fruit. That will be your proof. How do you know the fruit is good? Each fruit has its own fragrance, just like you can smell the animals. They all, each have their own smell. And you brought in all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, meekness, love um, joy, uh, don't use your mind to smell, use your nose. And if you can't, you can't smell the fruits of the Holy spirit until you have them and you can't have them unless you grow them. So, sow the fruits of the Holy spirit to take care of the animals. I love that, that the fruits of the Holy spirit everything um and every time there is a prophet there's bound to be a choice and then the last part again uh so make a choice stand for the world the flesh and the devil and go against god or stand for god and fight the world the devil and the flesh make a choice smell the kingdom of heaven beautiful i um I think I'm going to make note cards with many of these things and put them up to remind me. I mean, really sowing the fruits of the Holy Spirit is um, key. So that's what I need to do. Thank you, Father Michael. Thank you, Denise, for paying attention and recording and reporting to me what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then I'm doing my threefold what? Uh oh. What is the point? What is the point that I was saying? Here it comes. So, so what? <laughs> and no I mean, it, I sound really chaotic. And uh, no, that was me. That the chaos, <laughs> chaos comes from me, no, no, not from you. No, that's that's uh, that's how I perceive uh, my homily. Mm, no. It seems there's no no point <laughs> for Here. me as an objective observer. Is he, uh, I'm not the uh, the homilist. I'm just the um, the lay person. Okay, I'm the lay person sitting there in my corner and writing down. What is your point, Father? You have, you make too many points. Oh no! Uh, it all came together. Points. All the points. Too many points. I don't want to know what to take home with. So thank you. But you see, while you were sharing the homily of some priest by the name of Michael. Um, I was asking the question, what does Thanksgiving smell like? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Like, what does Thanksgiving smell like? Buck, 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 buck. Or, Christmas. Oink, oink, oink. Or, <laughs> no. It smells, smells like, like Christmas. No, Thanksgiving smell the turkey. Does it? <laughs> Thanksgiving. Some people, yes. Don't you eat turkey at Christmas also? No, you don't. No, so. You can't smell Thanksgiving unless you're thankful. Yeah. Literally, you smell the the um, the roasted turkey or the fried turkey, and you hear children okay laughing. Okay, thank you, Denise. I think that's a cheat. Why? Why? We're studying. We're studying the uh, the, the scripture now. We're um, we're reporting my homily. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next day was about preparing the way of the Lord. Yeah, that's very different. Different yeah. homily. Same reading, but different homily. Yeah. Okay, now let's correct. It is not Latin, but it's Greek. Metanoia is Greek. a Greek. Okay, okay, thank you. I gotta correct that on here. Emeta is uh, like um, 
metaphysics. Yeah, so it's yeah, fun. Okay, no oh, problem. I did, put it. I did say Greek, oh, and I read it wrong. Sorry. Don't worry. We uh, we're gonna fix. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Denise, and thank you, Father Michael. Yes, thank you, Father Michael. Many, many. I, I get the moment of being narcissistic. narcissistic. <laughs> Hey, where is he from? <laughs> <laughs> He's from California, but he was at uh, okay. a retreat in Houston, Texas uh, for Papa. Uh, you know what Vince said? What? I couldn't believe it. California knows how to vote. What? Well, we, we had the voting, the election. Uh, and he said, okay. he said, That's oh, right. I remember. California, you know how to vote? Yes. <laughs> you don't have to count. You know how to count votes. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. you know how to count vote Californians they, they, they vote and they count it for years afterwards still counting votes the election is over they're still counting votes mm -hmm. after half a year oh dear we, oh, wow. okay so let's move on thank you Denise and uh, move on last but not least mm -hmm. Olivia yeah hey Hello, good morning good morning everyone um, I did the same thing as Linda. I, I opted not to uh, go over your homily, but to find a, a fresh one, fresh ideas. Um, and I went to Bishop Robert Barron <laughs> as well. But it, I, I, I guess I heard differently because it's different from the what she reported, or at least what I heard her say. The first sentence is, John the Baptist appears in the desert. Why go there? And then this uh, last sentence is, um, be baptized with water, but also with the love of God, the Holy Spirit, and fire. So basically, he said that uh, uh, the reason that John the Baptist went to the desert, and so did Jesus during Lent, uh, was to uh, get away from the distractions of life, and and that uh, uh, we engage in a lot of uh, uh, diversion. And so this is our opportunity to ask the great question: How do I stand with God? You know, it's just you and God alone. So he says, meet John the Baptist. Uh, he says, uh, repent and reform. And he did talk about metanoia, where he said it was Greek and that it went beyond, go beyond your mind and have a change in your thinking. Um, and he says, the reign of God is at hand is what John the Baptist was preaching. And who is this reign of God? And John the Baptist is directing his audience to the kingdom of the person of Jesus. Heaven and earth have come together and um, they're here with us. So he says, come to the desert uh, this Advent, leave behind sin and repent and reform, change your minds and open your eyes so you can see the new kingdom, leave behind all diversions and distractions. He said in this culture, this present culture, sin is de-emphasized with the thinking that don't worry, God is good, he is love, everything will be okay. And so we need to confront our sins. To confess is to start the healing process and to let the grace of God work. He says in society, the stress of it was on the grace of God first before confession. And confession just kind of fell off the table. You know, people just kind of could go into confession because grace was emphasized. We try many ways to figure ourselves out. We go to therapists, we do self-help videos, we do yoga, read books, etc. But we need to stream toward God and the healing starts with the confession of our sins. And the best way to enter the desert is to stream to the confession. He says that a good example is the 12 step program. Uh, he says, they don't say it's okay, don't worry. What they say is find out what's wrong with your soul. Find out where you messed up and you take a moral inventory of yourselves. And he says that many times they see John the Baptist with an ax and, and he's a, a, a gardener, right? You have a plant and if you don't prune the plant, it will not be fruitful and the plant will die. So everything in us that is dead, like our sins, need, needs to be cut away from us if we want to be fruitful and to grow. And so God wants to divinize, divinize us and draw us into his holy life. So the what for me is, 
Uh, it's very simple thinking here, but we need to confess, repent of our sins, and this is the season to do it so that we can be ready for Jesus in Christmas. And the so what is I have to learn to be patient. Um, uh, I can go to confession and try to work on the seven inclinations, uh, but it's not an overnight work. It's going to take a while, and I have to be slow but persistent and persevering. And just let the Holy Spirit lead the way. That's it. Thank you, Olivia. That's wonderful. This is to say that you could hear one person saying the same thing, but the right. audience listener will hear different things. Right. Yeah. And all of them are good. Yeah. The works of the Holy Spirit. So you, you would hear Bishop Baron Linda say something and you take home with something else because that is the need of your heart at the moment yeah and then olivia takes something else so there's um everything is okay but it's very helpful okay it's all about repentance it's about confession going back to uh, reconcile yourself with the lord okay so thank you olivia thank you bishop barons again for teaching us okay so can we move to the third phase now could we yes yes so what is what do we do with the third phase because you already shared my homily is there a need to study the bible oh yes definitely yes because we're going to hear the biblical context yes. of it. well i was very biblical myself when my homily, normally I preach biblically, okay? So, now, we heard Bishop Barron. He was uh, preaching from a pastoral point of view and liturgical point of view and a seasonal point of view. Seasonal logic, uh, liturg liturgy logic and pastoral logic. That means this season, he invites people to go confession reconciled to the lord okay and um and you see the pastoral point of view from uh, bishop from uh, the diocese of tyler of the atlantic is about building the kingdom it's biblical but there's a point there's a mission there's a purpose right uh, the logic is build a kingdom by joining you know in the uh, ministry to serve the church to build the kingdom so that's the logic it goes outside outward outward okay but when we study the scripture, the Bible, we study inward, inside. But so it's, it's the distinction is this. You, yet, you take the word of God and you apply it to your life, church life, society, okay? Personal, you're applying it and you build the kingdom. Here, we take all the experience we know and we illustrate or we try to understand what Jesus means. Okay, so we first focus inward, not inside ourselves. We focus on the word itself, okay, on the scripture itself. So we try to find out what it meant at that time, okay. So we would uh, use our experience, but it, all those experiences are anecdotes or illustrations for what it, me it means inside the, the context of the Bible. Okay, so there are two, uh, two ways. One is outward, one is inward. Okay, one is to do. We're not talking about doing here. We're talking about knowing. Okay, and to know. And know is very, uh, is very personal, it's very private. Okay, what you know depends on you because knowing is about choosing. You hear many things, but you make a choice to choose to hear a certain things because you need it to hear it, okay? So, does it make sense at all? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, why the two homilies uh, reports were different from yeah. uh, Olivia and Linda. Yeah, it's a preference. Yeah. And the new time. So, it's, you know, so knowledge that way, okay? So, now let's take a look at the text first. We have uh, Matthew, the context, the text would not have any meaning whether the context, because the context creates the content. Now, 
since we have uh, studied or learned or practiced, we employ and we practice the art of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we say the word to think, we understand it to mean solving problem, to solve problem. Okay, that means we have to find or seek a problem, determine the problem and decide that is a problem to solve. And then we proceed to solve the problem, right? Okay, so what is the problem? How about counting the problems for me, with me in this reading, uh, the um, Gospel of Matthew chapter three, verse one to 12, only 12 verses. How many problems do you think there are? Just, you know, say anything, just brainstorming. We're, we're doing this process of uh, critical thinking. You read, you read the text, okay, let me read it to you real quick, and then you jot down to see how many problems are there, okay? John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm jotting down my, my problems as well. It was for him that the prophet Isaiah, it was of him that the prophet Isaiah has spoken when he said, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his path. Okay. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had um, a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem or Judea, and the whole world region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When they saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brutes of vipers, who want you to flee from the wrath produce good fruit and as evidence of your repentance. Do not we presume to say, to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, so I have to stop here. How many problems you get so far? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Three. You got three problems. I'll leave you how many problems you have. Five. Uh, Linda, how many problems you have? Two. Okay. So we need to learn to say, I have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. We need to get problem, okay? If you don't de define or determine the problem, you would not, you know, see it and you would not want to solve it, okay? I, as the more I read, the more problem I see. The number one problem is that some of the things I do not understand. Ignorance is a problem, isn't it? And misunderstanding is not the problem, right? Lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. So when I see something I don't understand, okay, that's the problem. I'm going to solve my ignorance by studying, learning, looking up the dictionary, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm not talking about the, you know, the scripture yet, but I'm talking about how to approach it, okay? And we approach it biblically. So I'll, I'll list you to you my problem, okay? My first problem is preaching in the desert. We went to the desert. <laughs> you go to the church, you go to the city, downtown, you go in the desert. <laughs> Who's going to hear you? The coyotes or the lions or the uh, snakes? That's a problem. Jesus would go and, you know, Jerusalem and synagogues. He has a different idea. This is really ridiculous or oh, weird. I pre you know, he's preaching in the desert. Yeah, so you want, to, want, you want to give a piece of your mind to your children? I'll go to the desert. I'll give a piece of mind to the children. I have a problem with the government. I'll go to the desert. I'll preach to the government in the desert. It's not a problem. Yeah. See, that's the report. Okay. John the Baptist appeared in the desert court, in the desert, preaching in the desert of Judea. 
Now you talk to the desert and you tell the desert repent. <laughs> the kingdom of God <laughs> is, <laughs> is at hand. You're talking to nothing. Snakes. Okay, that's the first, first problem. Okay. <laughs> However, I don't, know, I don't know how. Okay, somebody heard it. Mm -hmm. How did it get there to the ears and the, you know, the mind of the people? It's a crazy thing that uh, when you use the word desert, right? Then people flocked into the desert to hear him preach. <laughs> Is that something really strange? Mm -hmm. We have heard this reading so many times. Mm -hmm. You hear bishops and priests and deacons and all your years, okay? You heard it again, again, every Advent season and every Lenten season, you hear it again and again. Do you have a problem with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so some problem to, uh, um, to consider. Okay. I still wonder. This is a problem, isn't it? Preparation is a problem. Is the desert straight or crooked? The desert straight or crooked? Crooked. Very straight. No, not always. Sometimes there's dunes. Up and down. And wavy. Yeah. So, and Matthew say, uh, Prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, may straight his paths. How are you going to prepare the way of the Lord in the desert? <laughs> How are you going to make this uh, path straight? If you put it, you know, this, this verse, Isaiah, in the context of the desert, it doesn't make sense. The moment you make the way and the winds, and the snow, you know, stand storm comes over and there's no more way. Hmm. How are you going to prepare? Any, any way you, that you prepare, is, 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 there's going to be no way. So does that mean that the implication is something else? See, in the study or the art of critical thinking, this is, you, you have a problem, you got the information around it, and the information is there's a desert. The information is that you have to prepare the way. The information is that there is no way. The way you walk is the way. The path that you tread is the way. You walk first, somebody follows you, and then people follow you. That's the, the way, isn't it? You make the way. And then after you make the way for a while, the uh, snow and you know, sandstorm comes, it wipes out the way. Hmm. How you're gonna prepare the way, how you're gonna make straight the way in the desert. So the problem is not just with the way, the problem is the desert. Is that not the problem? What do you have in the desert? Sand. We studied this before sand, sun, and soil, sand, sun, soil, and what? Maybe snakes. And snakes. Yeah. Maybe. So you go there to die. That's the problem. That's the place of death. Wasteland, wasteland is our life, our soul, the desert, the wasteland. Why did the prophet, you know, John, the Baptist, prepare, you know, proclaim or preach in the desert? That's really strange. How strange it! It's really you. It's, it's shockingly strange. John the Baptist. That means he's gonna baptize people, and if you want to baptize people, you have to have water, and you're preaching in the desert. Where's the water in the desert? You did. You we went to the Holy Land, right? You see the parched land, right? Really parched land. So if you have an oasis of water, that's paradise. So the desert means death, also means dependence. And you cannot depend on nature. You cannot depend on anybody else but the Lord God. 
if you are able to find water that comes from God. I'm just looking at the implication. So how many problems do I have so far? I don't know. So the first one is um, preaching in the desert. Second one is, um, uh, you know. No water. Yeah. Prepare. How are you going to prepare the way? Yeah. And the problem is that you're going to die in the desert. And uh, you, you, you take the name Baptist, Baptist, John the Baptist, and you want to baptize people with water, you give a shower to people, right? But you have no water. And you baptize them in the desert. That's a problem. Then look at the John, his clothes, clothing. How do you make clothes out of camel's hair? Do you have a problem with that? No. Yeah. How do you take the camel's hair and you make clothes with that? Have you ever seen anybody wearing camel's hair clothes? Hmm. No. We have no idea what that is. Yeah. We just assume that, okay. So uh, does the John the Baptist look like a camel? Or smell like a camel? Probably. <laughs> no. So he should be. Does, does he have a hump yeah. in his back? Every time I hear John the Baptist, I, you know, I imagine he has a hump or maybe two humps on his back. <laughs> because he wears camels, hair, uh, clothes. Maybe he made it for himself, and then he uh, he got the leather belt on his waist. Leather, that's amazing. Where did he get the leather belt? Which leather, which skin does he take? Crocodile? Did he go to Louis Vuitton to get the leather belt? <laughs> <laughs> it's a camel's hair, you know, clothing, and then you have a belt, fancy belt, leather. <laughs> when he use a straw or something to, to be about they'd use about yeah so very one part is is very fancy the other part is very wild hmm. does it mean anything i don't know so you have to use your imagination and that's a problem when you use some um, imagination it may not be true it may be true but it says something it, the, the two things contrast and the specific details coming from Matthew, he recorded it. Was he, um, well, Matthew, was Matthew a disciple of John the Baptist? Uh, did he know about John the Baptist? Maybe he does. That's why he wrote about him. Okay. And he heard about John the Baptist even before Jesus because he was, he was a, once a tax collector. Okay. And if people pay tax, they would talk. Talk about this man, crazy man, the voice in the desert. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we observe and they say, okay, this man, how describe to me? Well, he has a well weather um, leather belt. Even my own belt made in China is not made of uh, weather leather. You have any leather? <laughs> is it expensive? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would think so. Now, so it says something about something wild, something uh, fancy. We wonder, and so we have to replace, uh, but to solve the problem of our wonderment with uh, imagination. Do priests in the temple of Jerusalem wear belts? Yes. So we have to study the, you know, priest in the temple. You have any priests in the temple? You have a picture of priest in the temple of Jerusalem? Mm. Okay. We're studying. Okay, we're studying together. Oh, they do have belts. They do have belts. Okay. At the room. So they do have belts. We we'll call it a shash. Is that a shash? How do you spell that, Father? 
S A S H. Oh, sash. Yeah. S A S H. Yeah. It's a sash. sash uh -huh. Or girdle. Yeah. Wow. So, and we have to recall that John the Baptist was born of the Levi. Was in his, his father was what? Zechariah. His father right. was what? the one priest that went into the temple to offer the incense to the Lord. And he had an encounter with God and you know, with the angel. I remember? Yeah. So would his father have some kind of a vestment, priestly vestment? Yes. So, hmm. What do you need? Oh. And so uh, we're, we're assuming a lot of things here, okay? We're studying yeah. Okay, so that's my problem. I tell you, just the uh, he wore clothes, clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. Why? Why did Matthew put that sentence there in there? What is it for? Because they contrast each other. It looks really weird. Yeah. Does that does that uh, make sense to you? Is that a problem with you? It has to have some kind of implication right there. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you what it is. You have to find out. <coughs> so the clothing and then the food, locusts and wild honey. Heine honey, I could understand. But locusts? Yum. Okay. <laughs> I, I did eat some locusts, you know. There's some... Uh, the crickets, there's a call, a, I, I mentioned about the rice cricket in, in Vietnam. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we put um, either, you know, we roast them and we put um, uh, peanuts inside its belly. Yum. They're crunchy. Yum. Yeah. Or cashew, we put cashew. In Mexico, uh, they eat crickets. Crickets, this big, very big, okay, very big. And you put cashew nuts inside and you roast it. But some cool. people... Do you eat but, the legs too, Father? If you fry it, I can eat. If you're hungry, yeah. you know, they have a lot of protein. Yeah. Yeah. If you're hungry, you eat. But this, this is not like you're hungry. You really eat this uh, delicacy. So they eat. Mm -hmm. I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> so, Check problems. Out. But see, you have problems since you, you we are setting the, up the stage, right? The stage, you have to have a lot, lot of problems, color green, blue, yellow, red, whatever. And the decoration, you have to set up the scene, the scenery, the scenery scenario, and then you place in the main problem. What is the main problem in this um, 12 verses? What is... What is the problem now is when we say that, it means there's a personal problem. We're not talking about the natural problem, nat problem with nature, okay? Problem with the clothing, problem with the food. We're talking about the human problem here. Many kinds of problem, okay? It's cold, it's wet, it's dry, it's a desert, I'm gonna die, all those things. But now there is a problem. In this gospel reading, what is the main problem? Human problem, personal problem. And whose problem is it? Yes, tell, tell me, Olivia. But the Pharisees and the uh, scribes were following him into the desert. Is that a problem? Well, that means that they uh, were giving him uh, importance in terms of what he was saying. Yeah, of course. So do they have a problem with John the Baptist? Mm -hmm. Apparently so, because he called them vipers. <laughs> oh. Matthew never said that they have problem with the uh, with the uh, John the Baptist. Okay. Okay. So now you that, that's a problem. Okay. Now he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for see coming to his baptism. Mm -hmm. He saw them. Let's take a look. At John the Baptist. Once again, the question where did he come from? What kind of clan does he belong to? Family. What is, what is his family? 
they were Levites. Yeah, so now Zechariah was a priest. And mm -hmm. the Sadducees are, is a group of priests. Does he recognize the priests, priestly people? We have to mm -hmm. assume that he does, he knows. He grows up, you know, in the priestly family. Why did he leave, you know, his uh, family's so-called business or life? Okay, a calling to become a prophet, to become a uh, itinerary preacher. Okay, what did he do? Why did he do that? His father was famous. And then from since the time of his birth, everybody said he's gonna be somebody, you know, great, a great prophet. And they know the sign of his father getting uh, mute, wounded, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they should have known, you know, he's famous in Jerusalem. So John does, would John have known about these priests and Pharisees? He, he should know about a lot about them. Mm -hmm. But the moment he saw them, see, they come to his baptism. You have to ask the question, why did he go into the desert? And why did these people go out to his baptism? Mm -hmm. The moment you see somebody and you know who they are, they know who you are, they know you belong to their clan, okay? The Sadducees or the priestly clan. The first one, you see somebody, for a long time you've seen them and you start cursing them. Is that good? <laughs> As if you're the enemy. <laughs> oh, they just come to see you baptiz baptizing in your baptism and, and somebody, you and you know, you're baptizing your, your grandkid or, you know, your, your, children baptizing their, their children. And then the moment somebody comes in and you turn around, you curse them. You, root of vipers. Is that a big problem? Mm -hmm. And Matthew was very, very excited. And I, it seems like he's very okay. He's okay with uh, reporting this. It reflects something about the attitude of the apostle against the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember, this is year 70, right? 80, 80. Mm -hmm. That means there's the collapse of, um, um, of Jerusalem and the temple already. Mm -hmm. And these are representative of the temple people, of the temple. And they play the ma uh, major role in destroying the temple. So the feeling mm -hmm. when the country collapses or you lose your country, Okay, I went through that experience. So who do you, are you going to blame? Okay, the government, the mm -hmm. previous, because of you, we lost our country. Because you Pharisees and Sadducees, we lost our temple and now our nation. They are splattered, scattered all over. So the feeling is right there in Matthew. Imagine he was writing from the 80s and the temple was destroyed in the 70, year 70. So, Who's gonna be uh, the, the target for blaming? These religious authorities. Mm -hmm. and, and when you read this, you read Matthew and the people who read his gospel, they were in shock or hurt because they lost their temple, right? Their Jews. And so they're gonna blame the authority all because you killed Jesus, all because you are greedy people, greedy group, a whole bunch of greedy people. And so you get the money for themselves and you did not listen to the Lord and you even killed the Lord. So you see that context? Mm -hmm. I'm reading in uh, from where it is, okay? From there, take it out from there. So just the saying about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, okay? You brute Bible who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Why would you bring in already the fact that they killed Jesus when it doesn't say they, they killed Jesus? Huh? Now you have to read it uh, critically. Yes. This happened during the year around. See the 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 story or the events. This event happened the year around thirty. Let's say, okay. okay. John the Baptist came out and preached in the desert year thirty. Yes. Forty years later. Okay, that's 70. Is that right? Right. The, uh, the general by the name of Titus later on became the emperor. 
He brought 70,000, you know, soldiers even more. They came and destroyed completely the city of the Temple of Jerusalem. Okay. And the whole country, the whole nations, see Israel and, um, and Syria was a province of the, uh, the, the Roman Empire. We got a Syrian, Syria, Palestine uh, province. Okay. There was no Israel as a country, but now they destroy all the people. The remnant or the symbol of uh, the people is the uh, temple. They destroyed completely. Okay. From year 30 to year 40, and year 40 to year, and uh, 40 years later to year 70 and 70 to 80. So Matthew was writing some 50 years later. Okay. So now he was writing to the audience or to, to the leader, uh, the, the, yeah, the audience who is a half century later. The event happened half, half a century, 50 years ago. Now, these people who are listening to the writing, the gospel of Matthew, they are experiencing all these kinds of pain and suffering because they no longer have their own country, their own temple, their own people. They are scattered all over. They're the Jews or the Israelites, right? The Jews. So you understand that? Yes. And so take into consideration what happened during Jesus' time and what happened during the evangelist time. The audience there, and then we are 21 centuries later, we have a different kind of perspective. So three contexts, the context during Jesus' time, okay? Context during the apostles or the evangelist time and the context in our time is complicated. We can just say, okay, we read it and we interpret it right away. How would the people, the community of Matthew react? Yeah. How would they understand it? Well, only 50 years ago, we were, we saw, you know, 10 years ago, we saw the temple still standing there now, no more temple. Whose fault is it? Well, you have the authority, the church authority, the religious authority. Hello, Maria. God bless you. So that's the problem. And you, you read this and people get all excited because of who is there with Maria. Okay, God bless whoever is there with Maria. Okay? Thank you. Sorry, we just left the doctor. <laughs> okay. You left the doctor. That's good. And you get into this doctor right now, right here. <laughs> okay. So we go back to the, the, the study of the, this um, Matthew. Okay. So you see three contexts, right? Three communities. Okay. Now, St. John, John the Baptist community, and then Matthew's community, and our community, Papa's community. Okay. And the, watch this YouTube. We'll take it from a different perspective, wherever you are, maybe in Nigeria, maybe in Australia. Okay. They will take it from the Australian point of view. Yes. They will interpret it, interpret it from an Australian point of view, or maybe okay. in the Netherlands or the UK. So understand. And so we have to respect the context, right? Okay. So now, we're talking about, we imagine the community of St. Matthew when they heard this of Pharisees and uh, Sadducees and uh, John is looking at them and call them brood of vipers and who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. So in a way, people were really raging or angry at these people. If you were part of Matthew's community, are they, okay? If the Jew, you are, if you're Jewish or, or you know, belong to, uh, the, you know, they're, they're Jewish, okay? So, now, you hear this? It is um, kind of a curse, but at the same time, a warning, at the same time, is a, a very salvific warning for these people. It is a, a play. You look at it as kind of a play onward or a technique that you use to convince people to bring people back. So instead of, uh, instead of uh, saying that these people in Jerusalem, okay, repent because you see there's no more temple, there's no more country and you need to repent. And you, people are already hurting, okay? They're hurting because they lost their, their, their identity and you go straight to them and you tell them to repent and you talk really, really harsh on them. They get even more hurt. So instead, you use the word of John the Baptist and use a very harsh word on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It wakes up those who are thinking they're well, you know, well, 
to do or they're okay with their lives. And the warning is this, okay, uh, who warned you of the, to flee from the coming wrath? There's vengeance, there's justice. Huh? What you did, you did was wrong. And so you think you repent and it's gonna be okay. After you repent, okay, I'm sorry. Is it gonna be okay? No. You have to prove that you are really truly repented. And the way you prove it and you know it, the answer is you have to produce good food. Fruit, not food. Maybe uh, fruit for food. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not just, oh yeah, I'm so sorry. No, no, you show it. You say you're repented, right? And this applies you now the Pharisees uh, during the time of John the Baptist, gone, long gone already. Okay, John the Baptist, long gone already. So this applies for the community of St. Matthew. The listener to St. Matthew uh, during his time, that also applies to us. You, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. So it came to them already, last coming to the community of Matthew and coming to our community. If we do not repent, if we do not produce good fruit, and the way we repent is to produce good fruit. The definition of repentance is to produce good fruits. The definition of repentance is to produce good fruit. Not just say, oh, I'm so sorry, go to confession, Father's gonna give me three Hail Marys and that's repentance. No, the definition, literal, practical definition of repentance is to produce good fruit. I'm not making this up, I'm taking it directly from the gospel. So all these, you know, uh, all these times when we, uh, when Advent and, and Lenten season comes, or, you know, times for you to go to compassion, do we understand that the act of repentance is to produce good fruit? Does anybody do that? So no. this is not for me. So, and the, yeah. the fruit, the evidence I produce, but there's no fruit and even the fruit I produce are rotten. No, it has to be good fruit. And you have to show that people could eat it because people could benefit from the fruit hmm. of your repentance. So it's, and they say, when we talk about repentance, it's only about me, me and God, God and me, God forgives me and God loves me. And they say, no, no, repentance now is very social and public and um, it's not just you and God alone. People have to be able to reap from your fruits of repentance. That's true repentance. People have to see it, feel it, and taste your repentance through the good fruits that you produce. And that really rhymes. The fruits that you produce for repentance is good. <laughs> or consuming. Yes. We could sing a song about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah. I, 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 it, I can follow what you're saying, Father, but it doesn't seem to um, uh, make sense to me. You know, mm -hmm. when we go to confession, you know, um, you know, 10 hour fathers, there's a priest that gives a, a rosary, no matter what you say, you know, rosary. But, you know, so that's the repentance, right? Uh, but how do we produce good fruits? Yeah, that's a question. Now, mm -hmm. the, the assumption or the understanding of repentance for Catholic is this. I did something wrong, okay? I, I, I hated uh, Mary Jo so much, okay? I hated her so much. I put uh, two escargot in her uh, shoes, okay? Just for, and because I hated her, okay? So I may be, uh, maybe, uh -huh. okay? No, to those old snails, I just don't like her. I put snails in her shoes, okay? And then at night, I couldn't sleep, so I repent, I feel so sorry. And then instead of going to Mary Jo and say sorry to her, I go to uh, one of the pastor, maybe Father Lanik. Say, Father, I hated Mary Jo so much. And then I put three snails in her shoes. Okay, three I'm so snails. free. Yeah, and then then Father Lanik said, Okay, no problem. Uh, go home and say three Hail Marys. That's done. Right. 
we think that uh, sins only affect us. I feel guilty as long as I get rid of the guilt in me, the feeling of shame and guilt, and that I'm done, that's forgiven. How about the shoes, Mary, Mary Jo's shoes? Huh? Those shoes still have three snails in, in them. You know, maybe I, I could take those snails and I cook a kind of a escargot soup for her, something like that. Oh. I'll buy her a new pair of shoes. Sure. Yeah. So it is since it's always, always communal, it's since not private. So you have to produce good fruit. Mm -hmm. So the meaning, true meaning of repentance is not just, you know, I, I went to compassion, I feel so good. The reason I go to confession, so I feel so good. I go home and that's it. I don't do anything anymore. That's cheating. So what is true repentance? So that's the question. And, and thank God for John the Baptist. He defined it. And thank St. Matthew. He recorded it and reported it and written down as forever Okay, in the scripture. So this is a very different way of uh, understanding what repentance is. Mm -hmm. It's not I'm gonna flagellate myself, beat myself up and say, okay, people look at Father Michael, how holy he is, he's fasting and he's doing these things. No, you have to show the fruit and people could reap the fruit of your produce or your produce is good fruits that you, pr you produce, which is the fruit of your repentance. Am I confusing myself? No, no not at all. Just never saw it that way. <laughs> yes, uh, Maria. Yes, Father? Maria. Yes. So could it be like if I scream at my kids and I'm mad at them, and then I go to confession before I, I feel bad? So the fruit will be I stop screaming at them and I be nicer to them? Not just not, feel bad about it? Be, that's a challenge, you know, after, after you go to confession and you uh, don't, don't you know, feel good because the confession, the absolution, right? But you go home and you don't scream at them anymore, right? Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> when Mary acts up. <laughs> so, so we react. The, the kids, and then you have to scream at them, oh, that's going to do harm to you, okay? So it may be something else here. It's not about, I'm going to stop screaming at them. Well, if you stop screaming at them, and they're going to continue on, they're going to, you know, they know how to, manipul to uh, manipulate you, yeah? Pit you against yourself, your own self. So... It's about repentance, and the definition of repent to repent is metanoia. Good fruit. Good fruit. Oh yeah, oh. the practical, the practical definition of you know. So we have many ways to define a reality. Okay, mm -hmm. so one way to define repentance is by its fruit. You produce good fruit, right? Mm -hmm. But yes. now, the the inner definition the definition inside the word is metanoia meta is to go beyond or beyond oh yeah it's the thing to consider beyond so you have to go back to that definition and you think beyond yourself you think beyond this world now this is a new point i want to make the kingdom of God is at hand. You come for repentance, but you have to think beyond yourself. What does it mean to think beyond yourself? Well, you have to think heaven. Mm -hmm. Even after Maria leaves the confessional, okay, and get her penance, and she did all her penance, she goes home, okay, and said, I'm not going to scream at my children anymore. Still, you are thinking like a human being. You don't think beyond human, beyond earth. You know, earthbound reality. You have to get into the state of thinking heavenly. The kingdom of God is at hand. 
now to produce good fruit. There's no fruit that is good without the blessings from heaven. Yes. Oh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking yet. Okay. You can connect it that way, but let's slow down. You, you, you're too quick, right? Yet. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be there, but let's, let's slow down a little bit. Okay. So, number one, the practical implication or definition of uh, repentance according to the scripture is direct, okay, direct book is to produce good fruit. And this is addressed to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That means these are the teachers of the law, the priests, and those who, who were supposed to be the righteous religious people. And John the Baptist is demanding that these priests and religious people to produce good fruit in order to prove or give evidence, obvious facts that they have repented. Evidence means something obvious. You could see, you could feel, you could taste, right? Right? And we ask the question, what does it mean to have to produce good fruit? Number one, what are the good fruits? Number two, number two, how to produce them? Two questions, two problems. Let's approach each of them. Number one, what is what are the good fruit? Well, any fruit on earth will corrupt. You leave it outside for a while, it will spoil. But the good fruit is, of course. If it's supposed to fruit that comes from heaven, heavenly. Okay, what are they? I could feed the poor person, but I just feed them because I feel guilty. Okay, I could cook for people and make people angry when they eat my food. My food is delicious, top quality, but when they eat it, they cry. Because <laughs> they cook. <laughs> the cook does not allow people to enter into his hell kitchen. <laughs> so it's, yeah, the material is good. They feel, you know, they feel uh, full because they're, they're tasty and all those things, but their heart, they don't, don't feel good. It has to go both ways. So what is this good fruit? How do you produce them? And how do you make them visible or evidential? And this apply only for two groups of people, the, the uh, Sadducees and Pharisees, mm -hmm. the religious one and also the priestly one. Basically, just the devout Catholics and the priest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so you see, that's uh, one problem we're trying to solve, right? And then he gets even deeper. John the Baptist through uh, the pen the words of Matthew. Some of the practical thing, the things you do, you have to produce good fruit, but and then you have to change your attitude as well. The, the deeds and the attitude. You keep presuming that you have Abraham as your father. You keep presuming because you're Catholics, therefore you're good, because you're Catholic, therefore you're good, and, and you're good because you're Catholic. Is that true? So presume the sense of presumption, change that attitude, go beyond, think beyond that attitude because I am born from the, this clan, priestly clan, right? Therefore, I'm a righteous person. John defied it. He did not accept his role as a priest like his father. He took the role of a repented sinner and a prophet and a priest about repentance. So the attitude, the, uh, the presumption that because I am born from this priestly clan, therefore I'm righteous because I know the law, I teach the law, I learn the law, that therefore I'm righteous. No, it's in doing, practicing okay, the law, not boasting that I belong to this clan or that clan. Okay. Don't presume that you keep telling yourself to say to yourself, I have Abraham as your father, as our father. And so he really get to the root, okay, of the rotten 
fruit tree and cut it, uproot it. God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Don't presume you are Abraham's children. Therefore, you're righteous. Abraham is righteous, correct? He's a father of faith. He's righteous, no problem. But are you? So if your father, your mother are righteous and holy and religious, does it mean that you are religious and righteous and good and faithful people? No, we take care of our own soul. So it gets to uh, the, yeah. Yeah. Can, can you give a, a, a practical example? You know, what if I, I go to a, a confession and I, I tell the priest that I'm envious of someone or I covet something? And um, so I haven't done any harm to anybody's shoes or done anything physical, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. what's inside. Uh, so how, how do you, the repentance is he gives you the, 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 the prayers, you know, to repent and you're truly sorry because you went to confession. So how do you produce good fruit from that? Okay, that's a good question, authentic question. So Olivia is envious of uh, Linda, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, you know, Linda, a good, uh, beautiful pair of shoe, a uh, flip-flop, okay, flip-flop, let's say flip-flop, envious. And then and, and Olivia goes to Father Michael and confess her sin. And Father Michael says, no problem, I give you three Hail Marys. I feel really good, okay? And so, you leave the confessional and you meet John the Baptist and John say, wow, you say, oh, you, you do your penance, but what are the fruits, what are the evidence of the fruit of your repentance? Linda didn't even know that you're envious of her you know, beautiful flip-flop. How are you gonna produce good, why should you produce good fruit? You do, do not influence, uh, affect anybody because of your sin of envy, yeah? Is that true? You have influenced nobody due to your envy. Is that true or no? Let's um, take a look at envy. Let's yeah. take a look at envy. Something just went my hands. It's not about the envy uh, against you know, envy with uh, Linda's because he she has a pair of flip-flop is because of the envy itself. When you hold envy inside your heart, that's a problem. What does envy mean? You smell the word envy and what kind, what do you conjure up when you smell envy? The snake. What does the snake have? Heartless. Yeah. Mold, mold, you yeah. yeah what, the snake, what, what, why are we afraid of the snake? Yes. Because it is, when it bites you, you die. Why do you die? Because the snake is poisonous. Poisonous. poisonous right? So envy is poisonous. It's not about, you know, it's not killing anybody, it kills yourself, you first. So, Olivia, you need to go see a doctor. <laughs> get the poison out but, but and, and my, my question was the, the good works father so the good works go see a doctor <laughs> go see a doctor <laughs> and then so get yourself healthy get the poison out of you otherwise you become like a snake an envious person you know it's gonna infect affect other people with your poison mm -hmm. you make yourself good you make yourself into a good fruit by not being poisonous. See, I'm applying it in a very pastoral way, as I call it, you know, uh, right. in a familiar way, okay? So I suppose when you see Linda wearing her flip-flop, go to church, flip-flop, flip-flop around the church, and you don't feel <laughs> envious at all. Oh, and you look right. at, oh, oh, Linda, okay? And then you're happy with her, and they say, where do you get the flip-flop? Where can I get one? Instead of getting really envious. And Linda said, okay, it's easy. Father Michael, make a lot of them. <laughs> I'm making up. I'm making up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Certainly the whole church wears a lot of flip flops mm -hmm. church. And it's going to be a problem with Father Michael. He's going to get really wrathful. Everybody mm -hmm. flip inside the church. <laughs> okay, so I'm making up here, having fun here. But the point is this. You produce good fruit by stop doing, you know, nurturing the poisonous fruit in your heart and your life. So you don't, don't become poisonous or toxic. We're supposed to, the children, the fruit of, uh, of God, right? The children of God, the image of God. And you, you want a, a practical way. You have to be the good fruit, the fruit of eternal life. And you could make choose out of the fruit. Okay, this fruit. Yeah. Maybe you could be an apple and or a strawberry, perhaps. Uh, Olivia could be a strawberry. <laughs> now, now uh, you know, having fun aside, how do you do it? Um, what do you counteract envy with? That's the fruit. What do you, what do you have? Yeah. Meek. What is it? Meekness. Envy? With meekness? Yeah. Did I teach that? I think so. Okay. So we have to take a whole course on how to uh, bear good truth. There are seventy uh, has seven heavenly uh, virtues to counteract the seven inclinations or capital sins, right? So we have to produce that kind of those kind mm -hmm. of uh, virtues in mm -hmm. us, around us. Okay. Yeah. Meekness comes from the heart of Jesus. So let's move on. Generous, generousness is um, counteract and right. So I, I think I, I spoke about generous is uh, generosity is to counteract avarice. Okay. Uh, um, in our Papa handbook, it says, don't wait, so be generous, don't be envious. Generosity over envy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah. And the Papa handbook, and in my heart is different. I I take uh, I take it uh, from a po different point of view. Okay. So number one, the deeds produce good fruits. Number two, the attitude for repentance. Mm -hmm. Don't presume anything. Okay. Uh, don't conjure up your own entitlement or whatever you think you have. That's John the Baptist said. Don't say I'm the children of Abraham. Okay. All right. And hear the warning. Okay, the axe is right there. Okay, the axe is right there and the fire is right there. And he reiterates his point, produce good fruit. But he is not really condemning at all. He's showing people the way to come back, to come home. Okay, produce good fruit. Don't presume what you have, you know. And then he said, okay, I'm baptizing with the water of for baptism for repentance. So we have to go through the ritual of uh, baptism. Okay. Then then he proclaimed Jesus or the Messiah, mightier one, mightier coming to me, to us. And this one, I don't even dare to uh, carry his sandals. Mary has uh, shoes. Okay. Linda has uh, flip flop. And Jesus wears sandals. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's mm -hmm. humility, isn't it? Humility. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so unworthy to wear, to carry his sandal. And then the, the Lord is um, coming with the Holy Spirit and mm -hmm. fire. Okay. So now let's go back to the problems. What is the main problem here? We have many kinds of problem, depends on the context, okay? When I'm hungry, I have problem with food or lack thereof. Then I'm thirsty, I have problem with water or drinks, lack thereof, okay? When I have a, you know, I'm sick, I maybe I have a problem with cold, I'm cold, okay? So when I have a, um, when my car, car broke, uh, broke down, I have problem with mechanics. 
okay, mm. things surrounding me, okay? I don't have enough money in my bank account, my pocket, I have problem with money or lack of it okay? But the problem in this gospel is about people, relationship. Relationship with God? With themselves, among themselves, and God has a problem with them. That's why he sent his prophets over to, okay, proclaim, declare, proclaim, repent, mm -hmm. okay, to remind them, to warn them. God has a problem, but he does not just say, I have a problem with you, I'm going to solve it. No, he solved the problem. He sent his people over to solve the problem. The prophets, he sent his son over to solve the problem. So what is the problem with people? With us, what kind of problem does God have with us, with you, with me, with us here? Just listen to the word, okay? I'm going to read that word again for you to hear. How does John Baptist look? at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What did he call them? Smell the words that John the Baptist used. You brood of vipers. No, the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? So, okay. So broods of viper. What does brood mean? Mm, that's a good question. It's like a whole group of vipers. It's like a mess of them. <laughs> it's the whole roots, family. <laughs> roots is a descendant mm -hmm. or the fruits of the children. Uh, yeah, the generation. It, in, in Greek, yeah, in Greek is generation, root is generation, but in Greek it is uh, uh, genema. Genema means offspring children of fruit. So you see the contrast between good fruits, produce good fruits, and roots of vipers. What are mm -hmm. vipers? Snakes. Poisonous snakes. Yeah. So you have on the one hand you have good fruits. On the other hand you have uh, children of snakes. Offspring of snake, right? The fruit of the snake, mm -hmm. the pipers, two sides. And this is the prophet John the Baptist way of looking at these people. Not just the righteous Pharisees and the, the religious, um, uh, religious uh, priestly uh, Sadducees. He don't call them, he did not call them, you know, priests and Pharisees, righteous people. He call them children the offspring of the snakes, of the serpent, the vipers. Wow. And these belong to his own clan, okay? He was a priest. He saw snakes in the priesthood. The offsprings of snake in the priesthood, of the religious people. And what does it mean? These are not just people. They are snakes, but they are poisonous. They are not just poison itself. They go, they spread poison around. That's the way he saw them. That's the way God sees these people. That's why the word fruits of vipers. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you add somebody and you see snakes. Has you, have you ever seen anyone of oh, that person's like a snake? Even Jesus looked at Herod and said, that's a fox. Yeah, you know, remember Jesus said, yeah, yeah, be careful fox. with the fox, Herod, right? Mm -hmm. He's a fox. And you look at these, you will say, they're snake, they're poisonous. Snake means poisonous. That's a problem. Do you have a problem with snake, anybody? Mm. Does God have a problem with snake? Yes. Yes. Okay. Huh. So that's the problem. He comes to get rid of the snake. And you know, the symbol or symbolism or the image of snake is Satan. 
and they infect us, they poison us, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he comes, he cleanses it. That's the problem. That's the repentance, that's salvation. Salvation is to come and get rid of that poison. Mm -hmm. The poison of the snake kills. So you have death and the Lord comes. What did he do? He took in the venom for himself, didn't he? Yeah. That's the problem. Prophecy simply is the whole thing. The problem is that we are to die. You talk about poison, you talk about snakes, you've got to talk about the offsprings of snake or the roots of vipers. You stay close to these people, you'll be poisoned, you'll be killed. You, you die. That's the problem that God has with our world, with us. We're dying people, and he cannot take it. He don't want it. He doesn't want it. Huh? But he's going to stop there and stop short and say, okay, go die. No. He comes to save. And in order to save, the solution is baptism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But baptism and repent for repentance is not good enough. Because you only know inside you produce good fruit, yeah, but of on your on your own, of yourself. How about this? Let's go to the end, okay, and read this wonderful, wonderful, very profound. So you have John the Baptist, and then and he was introducing to the Messiah. I'm baptizing you with water for the repent for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I, mightier than I, the one who is coming. Okay, he's coming. I'm not worthy to carry a sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. Sounds really rhyme, right? Fan, winnowing. Fan is in his hand. Is there such a thing, such a thing as a winnowing fan? Yes. Right. When, you, when, you, when you imagine in your mind, when you imagine winnowing fan, what I, kind of you? Like yes. a, uh, like a uh, sickle or not even... Um, Okay, so when when this is my imagination, when we make hay, yeah, we cut it down, and then it's all over the place. And then there's this fan rake thing that goes around like this and puts it into uh, rows. Separate. So that's what to me is like a winnowing fan. I don't know. That, yeah, yeah, that's your experience. That's right. You know it because you you work in the farm, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Olivia, what is your Im uh, image? I thought, it, I thought it was a rake. I thought it was a, a rake. You know what you have? No. Yeah, of course. That, that's true. Also. Huh. Yeah, it's like a uh, basket. A basket where they shake the grain and get rid of the. That's hmm. what they call the winnowing basket or the winnowing fan. If you have more than one, that's good. Uh, yeah, they say grain is shaken in the process of winnowing with the shape of a, the basket allowing the chaff to spill out more readily. And it okay. looks like a basket. Okay. So you're looking at like Google, Google, yeah, you're Googling it? Yeah. Okay. I know that one, but your own experience. Is, is not Google. What is experience? <laughs> but this what? is the old fashioned thing. <laughs> I, I understand, but have you ever seen it directly? No, I have not. Only now, only now on Google, right? right. I have some, we have many, uh, many uh, styles with that kind of, uh, you know, to filter the chat. I, I know how to do that. So I want to hear the picture of you in your mind, not uh, the real research yeah. immediate. Okay. So how about Linda? Uh, when do you, what do you uh, immediately, not looking, not doing research at all, in your mind? Don't cheat well, in your mind. 
I cheated because <laughs> I used Work. Bishop Barron's ex explanation. No problem. Which is Go like ahead. the separating the good from the bad. The Holy Spirit is the wind separating the good from the bad in our lives to spiritually no, cleanse us. You no, know, no, don't do the spiritual thing, right. do the physical thing. Okay, thing physically. Okay. Whirlwind separating. And what falls out in is the. What is the. In a practical term, a realistic term, what is a winnowing fan? It can be a Number, fork. Yeah, we cannot put the uh, the spiritual yeah. meaning on, uh, you mm -hmm. know. So what do you imagine when you see the word, the English word, winnowing fan? So what what is the, the practical things that you think of, the image of the mm -hmm. thing? Mm -hmm. but, I, I think of an that... instrument, an instrument that's whirling and there's okay. stuff on the ground and it's trying to separate okay how about the fan what do you think of the fan like wind <laughs> like you. wind for air so what does yeah what does a fan do air it gives you air blows okay. blows so how many kind of uh fans do we have yeah, the one that Maria has. Many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's one fan, right? Yeah. The fan that's in the ground, right? And then you have hair dryer, right? That's a fan also. Huh? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. before before we get into research, mm -hmm. let's uh, let's research our mind and our image in in our head first. Uh, so we have to clean it up, right? So I'm asking the question so we could do a kind of brainstorm to to do a kind of inter inventory of ourselves otherwise before we you know we get to the uh, the google you know, those things and we don't really know know ourselves what we have as we grew up in our own culture or childhood we see so why are you laughing uh, maria tell us how do you when you grew up in mexico what do you think about when people uh, filter or we know the winnowing fan for the wheat what does it look like for you? What kind of image? You know, in fact, for we, I'm thinking about the fans you use as weapons. Weapon? You can cut with the weapon fans. A weapon? It's a weapon. They have knives in them. So the window, winnowing fan has knives in them, a blades in them? Isn't that a sickle? A sickle is different from the winnow, winnowing but fan. But you say oh. what I mean. So I imagine the Lord would, you know, hit the book. Oh, that, okay. <laughs> so let's go back to what that means, okay? Now, these are coming from different um, background and uh, generations and culture. And we have to go back to Jesus' culture, the biblical culture. Mary Jo is correct, okay? Denise is correct, okay? And Linda is correct also, Maria is correct, and Olivia is correct, because that's you, you what you grow up with. Okay. And for me, we know a fan. Well, you could have a, an electrical uh, fan and you just uh, blow off all the chaff from the wheat. <laughs> Easy. Or you could create a kind of a wind, natural wind. Okay. You leave... Uh, your wheat or your rice on the, you know, the threshold and pour and then the wind comes over and phew, you could do that or you fan it up, whatever. Or you have what Mary Jo said, but uh, in Vietnam is like a round thing. And you, you know, you just shake it up and it flies and you shake it up and you blow and it's, uh, it flies away or the chaff flies away, uh, fall to the ground and leaves behind the wheat, the heavy, okay solid wheat okay or rice so that's what it is for us so but in the hebrew or in the greek here not hebrew this is how it reads it's quite interesting where is it okay here we go <laughs> okay. This is a fork.
the sound makes sense. The sound is but the one, but but the one, like pta. you sound. You hear the sound. Pta. That means oh. you're spitting, spitting, spitting. So there's spitting. air. Yeah, spitting. Of course, you have spittles and you have air, mm -hmm. right? But you spit. Tuan, tuan. Okay, that's the word. So imagine that it comes from the mouth when you breathe out, but you don't breathe. You know, slowly, you don't blow, but you spit. Very, very quick and very strong. Right? That's the literal meaning of the word. Okay. Put on, okay, put on. And the, uh, the word means the winnowing fork. Why do we have the fork? You lift up the hay or, you know, lift it up. That's uh, normal for many farmers, you do that. Yes. Okay, but here the image is that if this winnowing fork or fan is your own mouth. Huh. Other fork is if if you do that, I'm I'm using the biblical image, okay? But it's a the winnowing fork in the hand. See, the saying is a winnowing fan in the hand of fork fan. Okay, in the hand, in his hand, hand, fork, hand, fan. And this fan or this fork is gonna spit the action the act is so strong you spit out the chaff just kind of rejection because you're thick you're not the real wheat just thick wheat i'm gonna spit you out fan you away okay is that okay with you mary jo are you okay? So we have to slow down a little bit, okay? Otherwise, we get too quick ahead of ourselves. He will clear his threshing, threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. So we move from John the Baptist, we move to the Lord. And um, it is this, there's a kind of a, a movement, a motion coming from thinking below, thinking human, thinking like a human, thinking earthly. And the, the gospel leads us through this whole process from being human, thinking like human, from earth, thinking earthly, to thinking heavenly. Uh, thinking godly. Hmm. That's the whole process of metanoia or repentance to repent. Okay. You have to go through wind. You have to go through fire. You have to go through spittle water. Okay. You have to go through the hands. You have to go through the mouth. It's very, very uh, tangible or incarnational experience. Of repentance and the whole point of repentance is simply to detox the poison from ourselves because the name the word called the pharisees and sadducees the priests and the righteous or the religious people you are broods offsprings of snakes broods of vipers so it's kind repentance is not just simply i go confess my sins well you have to repent before you confess your sin. Confession is not repentance. You can confess some sin, but you some sins, but you don't do not repent. Repent goes deeper. It goes before and afterward. Repentance doesn't stop at the confession or absolution. Repentance goes all through the whole way from the beginning to the end during the time until the day you die, the day I die. Because the whole process of detoxing. Okay. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Ourselves. Even after I went to see Dr. Olivia and uh, to check on my uric acid, and she gave me with Dr. Grace some pills, some chemicals to stop my pain to get, but still the uric acid still in me. I have to detox myself all my life. So when we conflate or we identify repentance with compassion, mm -hmm. ah, we're missing something. And no wonder, I say, okay, I already confessed my sin and the blood of Jesus Christ washed away all my sins. Yeah. Right, but your body is still poisonous. Mm -hmm. Your soul is still poisonous. So the metanoia, the repentance is a whole process. It's life ongoing, a lifelong process. And the, the baptism of John the Baptist doesn't, it helps, but it's not the, the whole thing. Baptism for repentance is not... You have to have the fire of the Holy Spirit coming from Jesus Christ. And that fire will really separate the poison from you and cleanse you from inside out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, without the fire of the Holy Spirit, you have to go through the other kind of fire. Mm. That is reserved for the chaff. Mm the unquenchable, unquenchable fire. Mm -hmm. Which would you prefer? The fire of the Holy Spirit, yeah. which detoxes you, fire of the Holy or Spirit. the unquenchable fire, which burns you? No, not that one. The end. Wow. Glory that was very good, the, Father. <laughs> glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it, As it was, was in the beginning, beginning is, is now, is now and never shall be, and never shall be world, world without end. The Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. And with your spirit. May, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everybody, yes. for your attention. Thank you, listening. Okay, God bless you all.